Hi everyone! Thanks for joining us for week five, Who Let the Dogs Out Week of the Summer Discovery Program. We have a very fitting historical program for you today, World War II Dogs for Defense. Our presenter is Tim Carroll, author of World War II Akron, a comprehensive history of World War II that includes 108 images and a chapter on the Dogs for Defense program, which you will hear about in a moment. Tim's second book, World War II Cartoons by Webb Brown, includes 237 World War II cartoons in chronological order from 1934 through 1945 to tell the history of World War II. It's the only World War II cartoon book of its kind. Tim has a degree in history, and in his spare time, he is usually gardening or walking his dog, Willa. Please enjoy World War II Dogs for Defense. All right, I'm gonna start the presentation on the Dogs for Defense program with uh, Dogs for World War II with uh, this picture of Muck Plug, who is a uh, Siberian Husky. He was trained to carry uh, heavy duty machine guns during the war. Uh, obviously, when uh, uh, they went to war during World War II, dogs sometimes had to help carry some of the heavier, heavier stuff. And you see from this photo, uh, dogs helping to search for landmines along uh, railroad tracks. That's another thing. Obviously, dogs with their noses are uh, helping to sniff things out. They weren't just uh, attack animals during the time period. War dogs were always used in a variety of ways. And then, like, like, like the last one, they were, again, looking through landmines in the field, which was key to keeping a lot of guys from getting injured and, and killed. So they would go through the field with a group of dogs. They would flag the mines and then later sappers would go through and uh, remove the mines so people wouldn't get hurt. Uh, this slide's interesting, you see, you see it says star for the dog too. Uh, the husband was in the service and when you were in the service your family would fly a blue flag in your window to let everybody know that somebody was in the service or maybe you had uh, three uh, sons in the service, you would have three flags. In this case the family had two blue stars, one for the uh, husband and one for their dog that was in the Dogs for Defense program serving. And uh, you always had to be evaluated. There was criteria for the Dogs for Defense program. You can see this uh, four-legged soldier being evaluated by the doctor to see if he was physically fit for the Army, just like a, a human being. Uh, Dalmatians often served. It wasn't just like German Shepherds. Uh, there, there were all kinds of dogs. Usually had to be a pretty decent size. So you can see there he's measuring the dog to see if he meets the height requirements. But yeah, Dalmatians often were uh, in the military. And there's a couple other dogs that tried out for service, and there, there's a good sample of a, a rejection there. The littler dog, uh, her brother got uh, rejected for being too small. But So the one dog went off to service, the other dog uh, uh, stayed at home. And there's a poster for the Dog for Defense program. A man and his dog as the soldier stands next to a dog. Again, they would have been used in a variety of tasks during the war. That dog was pretty interesting. It came over from England during the war and had a tough time during the war period in England, but his owner was uh, inspired by the dog to start the Dogs for Defense Fund program. So that dog went on, on campaigns and posters across the country that raised a lot of money for the Dogs for Defense program, even though it couldn't serve. And again, dogs were an important part of the war for uh, all sides. In this case, the British actually uh, captured a German war dog and sent it back to Britain and basically was her, you know, lightly interrogating it to figure out what the Germans taught it to figure out, you know, what the Germans were doing with their dogs to see what they could learn about the Germans, not dog training and what, what the enemy was doing. And uh, dogs have always been used in war. This is from World War I, where uh, hospital dogs are surfing, searching for the wounded during uh, uh, a battle in France. Well, one of my favorite stories of World War II is a lot of people don't know that dogs actually were parachuted out of planes, especially to help flyers that were uh, shot down or crashed in rugged areas where they had to walk out. So they might have to walk for days, so these dogs would be parachuted out to the ground. Uh, they'd have supplies, food, and help these soldiers who couldn't carry enough supplies to survive for the days. Like, let's say they even crashed training in Alaska. Uh, they would have dogs with them that were parachuted out of a plane to help them. And you know, this dog uh, from, came home after serving in the Pacific and seemed to be struggling with uh, uh, what it, just like humans, sometimes the dog struggled with what they saw over and had to do overseas. And the, uh, the owner had to put the dog down, uh, but ended up having you know a, a, a burial for the dog that uh, uh, was given a, you know, a war hero type of treatment for its service. Uh, that dog is from Barberton, Ohio. And again, you see another Dalmatian there. And, that was kind of an interesting thing. If your dog uh, got done with service, I think this dog served 15 months in the Army. Just like a soldier, it would have given, given its discharge papers of where it served. Uh, just like a soldier, it usually lost uh, a decent amount of weight in the Army. 
Uh, and, and they would return on the on the train and the family would be there to greet, to greet it. And you can see this 12 year old boy is happy to have his buddy back. And I should say the Dogs for Defense program was families mainly donating their family dog to the military because World War II we were not prepared to go to war because we were isolationist. So that's why they needed so many dogs to volunteer. The Army didn't really have enough dogs trained and they needed these dogs. And then, uh, as I said, they gave them back typically at the end of the war. Chips faces reconversion. So they typically would detrain your dog because uh, they did often train the dogs to be aggressive in case they encountered the enemy or in case that they were, off, they were um, often taught to be aggressive towards the enemy. So they would uh, reconvert your dog before they gave them back. And in most cases, they would give you a warning. We can't be held responsible if they do bite you for some reason. <laughs> Uh, that's actually an Akron veterinarian who's very interesting. Uh, uh, he was a World War I veteran. He served in World War I when he was young. And then he came back and was a longtime vet in Akron, but he was still in the National Guard. So uh, later in life, close to, when he's close to 45, 50 years old, uh, they called him up to service in 1940 as World War II was breaking out. Uh, he was in charge of training war dogs and animals out of Camp Robinson in Nebraska. And I've even seen a picture of him performing surgery on a horse. They still used horses back then a bit. and. Uh, he, that's a picture of him in the Pacific with a captured Japanese dog as he was in charge of all the war animals in the Pacific, including all the dogs that were sent out overseas. So he was from Ohio and was a longtime veterinarian and probably didn't die until late 20th century. My grandma actually had his cats, uh, her cats taken care of by him. Like a lot of Ohio dogs, this would have been all, Dogs for Defense program would have been all over the country, including the Youngstown, Kingsman area, but uh, these dogs are from Dayton. Uh, Dayton dogs uh, could go to service all over the country. And then you see another um, a picture of dogs serving in, in prior wars. This again is World War I, where a dog is carrying, I believe, a message in, the, in this case. Dogs were often used as messengers, or they might come jumping through the battlefield, delivering ammunition to you uh, as you're in a firefight, and uh, they need, need to find ways to get you am ammunition. Of course, there were films promoting the war effort and films with uh, uh, the Dogs for Defense program featuring dogs to try to get people uh, you know, informed about what was going on and help motivate them to buy war bonds and things like that. And uh, they're always concerned about saboteurs or invasions uh, across the coast. The Germans even had sub activity in the Gulf of Mexico at one point. So, uh, and there was, of course, after Pearl Harbor, there was concern California would be invaded. So this uh, Akron soldier was stationed at, along the beach where they would have to patrol at night to make sure nothing was going on. Typically it was two Coast Guard men, but as they started using dogs, it was a Coast Guard. Uh, men and their uh, dog that would patrol the beach they, uh, alone. A few minutes ago, a little black and white dog dropped in on us. He wore a camouflage jacket. He carried packets of a carbine ammunition. His name is George. So that's just a soldier describing the battlefield. That's just a segment where he's telling uh, the newspaper reporter that a, uh, a, a dog dropped in to drop off ammunition in the middle of a battle. Oh, this, this is an interesting article. This dog was a problem around his neighborhood in Akron where he was running around killing chickens and other animals and when, when he got loose. But he actually went overseas and was a, a war hero where he helped in battle against the, against the Japanese. So he was a, actually a highly decorated dog. So kind of like some human beings. I mean, you know, I found some stories when I was doing my research for my book of uh, human beings that had gotten in trouble with the law, but then when they got uh, in the service or drafted, they you know, were getting uh, the Medal of Honor type of thing. And yeah, during, during their service, soldiers would often find dogs that were, uh, you know, randomly uh, on the battlefield, whether they were the enemy's dogs or they were just some citizen's dogs. So they would often uh, bring them home and try to find a home for them. Again, dogs were often used as guard, guard duty, sentry duty. Uh, you see this dog that was actually trained at the Arizona prison was donated for the dog for defense program, a hound. And there's a picture you saw I started the uh, a presentation with this one, close up a muck club. One of the Huskies now getting advanced training on how to carry a machine gun, and that's their training outfit out in the, uh, the East Coast. You can see the dogs being trained there along uh, alongside uh, the, the, the soldiers to carry heavy weapons and, and whatnot. And this uh, puppy was uh, injured uh, while he was stationed with the Coast Guard. And this guy, I think, was more of a just a, wasn't a dogs for defense, but more of a mascot on the ship, which sometimes the guys would sneak pets aboard. Again, another poster of the Dogs for Defense program, Dogs of War. They'd often have features in like Time Magazine or, or the local paper just trying to keep people informed. And you know, people love dogs, whether it's present day or 1940s. 
And another interesting photo, as they say in the caption there, that this dog was a pretty mild-mannered, uh, timid dog before the Dogs for Defense program. And you can see from the photo, it's not so much anymore. Dog from Dallas, Texas. And this little boy, like I said, a lot of families donated their dogs, so this little boy is carrying his dog to the Dogs for Defense uh, recruitment station to drop him off uh, for service. And this dog's getting evaluated, and looks like maybe even getting a bath there for the Dogs for Defense program. Del looks like another Dalmatian to me from the, the Dayton area. And again, they'd often find uh, pets overseas. I think this guy was from Australia, but went on a bunch of bombing missions and the soldier, soldiers snuck him back in his duffel bag into the US, even though they're not allowed to be on ships and whatnot. And uh, again, a lot of members of the family served during World War II. So this famous Olympian from the World War I period, um, who was on, on the radio, his son was in service and he quit to be in service and his dog was also in the military. So the whole family was uh, in the service. And, dads, all the sons, and even his dog. And that's actually Rin Tin Tin, who is the famous World War I dog found on the battlefields in France, and his uh, owner Lee Duncan brought him back to the U.S. and he became a movie star. And that's him in the 1930s comforting kids who uh, were disabled, often from diseases like polio. Um, and if you go to the next slide, which I believe is the last slide, his grandson, uh, Rin Tin Tin, was in the Army during World War II, so not only did he serve, they of course used Rin Tin Tin III uh, to promote the war effort. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation on war dogs. Um, like I said, the Dogs for Defense program ran uh, throughout the war. They weren't prepared for war, so they needed families to donate their dogs, which was a sacrifice for them, so that they could have dogs to uh, you know, do guard duty, sniff out mines, help with casualties, help get ammunition, and even parachute them out of planes. So when flyers were trapped in areas that were pretty rugged and having trouble surviving, the dogs could help them uh, more carry supplies to get out of there. Uh, World War II was the only time period where dogs were used from everyday citizens. Presently, in the, all the wars after World War II, the, the military recruited the, their own dogs into service and, tra and trained them. But during World War II, which was a unique time period, they were so desperate for help that they uh, asked everyday citizens to donate their dogs to the military. My name is Tim Carroll. I'm the author of uh, World War II Akron, which came out in 2019. And then I wrote a really good book on World War II cartoons. And uh, that came out in April of 2020. You can find both those book at, books at uh, timcarrollbooks.com. And I think you'll like both of them. They got information on the Dogs for Defense program in World War II Akron. And the World War II cartoon books is basically the history of World War II through uh, cartoons from 1934 through 1945 in chronological order to tell the history of the war. And the artwork is really amazing. It's, it's from the 1930s and 40s. Thank you.